To sit and learn Dafka in in, uh, in white, mm-hmm. but Sakanat uh, Nafashot. I hope everyone is safe now, and we should be. Uh, we should we shouldn't only know how to deal when Hashem sends us pain. That also we should know. We should also have an idea of how to deal when Hashem sends us brachas too, like snow. Mm-hmm. Like we always say, Hashem, how am I going to get through this hard time? What about like when Hashem gives you a bracha? Where's where's the cleave for a bracha? So this is important. In fact, it's probably even more important. So, tonight, well, first of all, tonight's learning, we're going to do it in memory of two very special people, parents of a dear friend of mine in L.A., who both of them passed away in the last six months, Miriam Bat Eliyahu and Zechariah <coughs> Ben Yaakov, my dear friend Nadir's parents, and Neshama should have an eternal aliyah and nachos from their children and grandchildren forever. Amen. All of us here, obviously, give a shout out wherever you want, for or in honor of whoever it is. <coughs> we have something so important to learn tonight. We have something, so I'm going to get right to it. We have something so important to learn tonight. Really, really important. Uh, right before <coughs> Sheer, a friend of mine texted, friend of ours, the Holy J. Wedge, texted me from, a uh, friend of ours texted me from Kansas. <laughs> City and he asked me, do you, do you, do we know how badly we need Mashiach? Yeah. And I said to him, if anyone in the world really knew how badly we need Mashiach, Mashiach would be here. And that's kind of what we're leading into tonight. Last Shabbos ended off, well, we're going to go backwards for a second. I'm going to say one thing, two things, which are really a recap of the last two years of learning. And it's really a hakdama. It's an intro for tonight's learning as well. Whoever I've had the privilege of speaking with the last few days, everyone's been sharing the word already that everyone knows now by now. That Rabbi Tzadok of Lublin 
and a lot of tzaddikim explain how the first thing that Moshe Rabbeinu was told by HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still the most important thing that any of us need to keep on hearing. What's the first thing that God told Moshe Rabbeinu? Shal na lecha na take your shoes, take your feet, take your shoes off your feet, because where you're standing is very holy. But in Chassidut we already explained many times that Shal na alecha na alaglecha. I first heard this from Moreno Reb Nason Siegel many years ago. He said, Shal na alecha na alaglecha. Remove the naal in Hebrew. Shoes is also the word for manul, a lock. Raglecha in Hebrew feet is also the word for hair gel, your habits. So the first thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu ever told Moshe Rabbeinu was, if you're going to be the leader of the Jewish people, if you're going to have the most intimate relationship with me, remove all the locks off your habits, meaning whatever you think has to be, Hechrech HaMetzius, remove it. Remove it, the first thing. Now, it gets even way deeper. I went from the Ginsburg Shlita, that any time, anything, in every single parsha in the Torah, there's a concept, whether it's gimatria or a remez or a, a kind of like a hint to the word breshit. All over the Torah, every parsha, the word breshit is found in it. Obviously, the whole world began with the word breshit. It's got to keep on showing up in your life. Rav Ginsburg pointed out that Shal Na'alecha Me'al Raglecha is Gimatria Bereshis, which is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. The Gimatria of the word Bereshit, the first word of the Torah, is the e- equal value of remove the locks off your habits. Shal Na'alecha Me'al Raglecha, Gimatria Bereshis. Does Moshe Rabbeinu get the message? Does he remove it? Yeah, you know, whenever something is told to us in the Torah, the Rebbe teaches, whenever there's a question in the Torah, and this is really important to know, that question, even if it's answered in the Torah, the Rebbe says, that question is alive forever. If I'm supposed to keep on learning the Torah every year and new, and I have to believe that every single word in the Torah was meant for me, every question was meant for me, everything is for me, that every single word, every single question that anyone ever asks, or that God asks, but that any human being ever asks in the Torah, is still omedet be'ena, it's still being asked in the world. Last Shabbos, we, and last Shabbos, we have a lot of shilas, a lot of questions, Moshe Rabbein was asking God. Some are, some are pretty, you know, they're all very deep, but some you could understand how, why he would ask such questions. When God tells him, you're the one, he says, who am I? And then he says, you're going to take Bnei Israel out, and Moshe Rabbeinu says, for what? Those are great questions. And then Moshe Rabbeinu says, but how is Paro going to hear me? Listen, look, look at the way I speak. I'm a stutterer. Good questions. <coughs> questions we could find ourselves in. But the last question in the Parsha is a very strange question. Moshe Rabbeinu, who was revealed, God revealed himself to him in the burning bush, looks up to Shemaim, and he says, God... Lama hare Why are you making it so hard on Am Yisrael? And the Rebbe says, even though Hashem answers Moshe Rabbeinu right away, really in our parsha the answer is tonight. What we're what, the answer of why is it so hard? You ever? It's perfect. Now everyone wants to know why is it so hard. Well, we, this is why we're here tonight. Why is it so hard? It's going to be great. It's going to be the easiest thing in the world. I'm going to learn it, and now we're going to know why things are so hard in life. <laughs> guaranteed. I'm guaranteeing everyone right now. We're going to learn why things are so hard in life right now. Isn't that great? Amazing. <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, though, is the one that's asking God, why are you making it so hard? You know, I would think that if God would reveal himself to me through a burning bush or a burning fork, whatever it is, I would never have to ask that question, why are you making it so hard? Because I know everything. I see everything. <coughs> Moshe Rabbein was asking God, why are you making it so hard? And the Rebbe says, you and I still have to ask that question, but the question is, are you asking it out of yush, out of despair, or are you asking it because you want to create a more concrete building in Am Yisrael? How are you asking that question? You have to ask that question. If you go through life thinking, a tzaddik is someone who accepts everything with love and he knows that everything is for the best. 
And therefore, whenever I have something troubling in life or I have a bad thought, I have to ignore it because a tzaddik doesn't question. Let's just go back to Moshe Rabbeinu, okay? If he's not enough of a reason for you to ask, I don't know who's enough of a reason for you to ask. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, God, why are you making it so hard on Am Yisrael? It's funny, no one asked yesterday, God, why did you save 45 Jews on a bus? That no one asks. But tonight, when a cop was just stabbed right outside of the issue of Right, right outside of Yerushalayim, he's in Matzav Benoni. Then everyone asks, why are you making it so hard? That's just our nature. We always do this. Why are you making it so hard in Am Yisrael? What Moshe Rabbeinu, according to the Ishbitzer, was really saying is, God, you could take Am Yisrael out right now. Why are you making it so hard on them? Bruchim Abayim B'Shem Hashem. Why are you making it so hard on Am Yisrael? For what? Who gets what out of this? Come on. Why are you making it so hard? That's how the Pasha ends. It's a very weird thing. <clears throat> Last Shabbos ends very weird. By the way, Pasha Bereshit also ended off pretty weird with God regretting the fact that he decided to create humanity. That's how the end of Bereshit ends, but we have this man Noah who comes and saves the day. This Shab- Last Shabbos, Moshe Rabbeinu says, why are you making it so hard? Tonight, what Reb Shlomo is going to do, I honestly want to share with you, his Torah is the most important thing in the world right now, in my humble opinion. Because it's not his Torah. It's, it's all the tzaddikim. You know, it's like every person has to believe that the Torah that they're learning is going to bring the great thing. So when I say this is the most important thing right now, that does not mean for one second that what you just learned today is not the most important thing right now. It is, and this is also. But what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to understand why God just doesn't say, here's Mashiach, based on the way that he answers Moshe Rabbeinu in the beginning of our Pasha. And it's utmost important that all of us tune in very strong. This is just two and a quarter pages of a very long transcript. If you want the whole thing, I always tell you, you could uh, definitely ask me afterwards. Now, the, I didn't have a, st- uh, a st- the stapler wasn't working. It's basically a, a one double-sided page and, and a little one over here. So if you pass these out, <coughs> each person should just take two pages. And if no one has that question, why are you making it so hard to you can, you can go home? I get to stay. <laughs> Who gets to stay tonight? <laughs> Who wants to stay tonight? Let's, let's go shlav by shlav, and tonight I'm saying it more than ever. This is the brilliance of the Shlomo, because this is based on three lines in the Meshivah. Fire. The what of Shlomo says. The Gemara says that the most precious learning, meaning the most precious <coughs> type of learning, is what's called Girsa de Yankusa. Girsa de Yankuta. That's the, the learning of a child. A child's learning is the most precious type of lo- learning that there is. What does it mean that you learn like a child? It means that when you're learning, it's not really clear to you yet. But 
something special is going on, which is how most of us, including myself, feel here, always. I never know what was really happening, but I could sense that it's something, that the learning, that there's something mind-boggling deep. And, you know, many of us walk out of here thinking, well, you know, if I really, if I was real, then I'd know what, he, what, 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 what we learned right now. And we'll see how that's not the point at all. In fact, that's like, that's the opposite. I'm learning Gemara. I don't really know it yet. I just know a little bit. But that little bit is so precious to me. Now look what he says here. When I know everything, meaning when I understand everything that I'm learning, oh, it's beautiful, but it stops being precious. The highest level in the world is that I know what I learn so completely, meaning it's completely clear to me whatever I did learn, but it's precious to me like it was before I knew it. I'll give you an example. I remember the first Sefer that I ever got really like on my own, I would say. Meaning, you know, obviously, I could tell you right now which are the, which are the, are the Bar, Bar, Bar Mitzvah books. You know, those aren't, I mean, they're special because of sentiment. But the first time you ever got a Sefer on your own, right? That first Sefer you ever got on your own, you didn't learn to get inside. And even the beginning that you did learn, you don't really understand exactly what it is, but the awesomeness of having it is so precious to you. Do you think, does it remain that precious to you as you start learning inside, trying to understand exactly what it means? Nature has it, that something of the preciousness that you tasted before you started learning, kind of diminishes, kind of goes away. He'll give a much better example, which has to do with one of the walls in this house. Does this to keep you guys... Uh, <coughs> now listen to this, imagine on the deepest, highest, most glorious level. Let's assume I didn't know that I'm a Jew, and suddenly, out of nowhere, I find out I'm part of the Jewish people like Yitzchak from the Moshav. Who is he talking about? He's talking about a friend of ours, Yitzchak ben Yehuda, who's a very famous artist. That's actually his piece. There are many pieces of Hebra that have all over the place. He's very big on Ketubot, on doing beautiful Ketubas as well. That's Yitzchak's, one of Yitzchak's most beautiful masterpieces, and he has many. Who's Yitzchak? He comes to Israel. I think his name was Ian or something back then comes to Israel and he writes a letter to his mother in Athens saying, I love Israel so much, I don't know why. She writes him back saying, you know, it's crazy, I, I forgot to tell you that you're Jewish. <laughs> so, he doesn't know anything. And the first time he hears about Yerushalayim, touches him so strong. But look at the next question. Can he ever get back to that moment? Can you ever get back to that moment before you knew what Yerushalayim was, when you just knew there was a concept, Yerushalayim? I'll never forget the first time I ever went to a Shlomo Minyan. I mean, we, I, all of us must have sang this nigun. I'm literally probably sang this nigun 10,000 times in my life. Right? Sometimes when I want to like pretend that I'm a baby again, I close my eyes and I try to remember what it was like when I learned that nigun, how much I was so hot. I didn't know what the words were, didn't know where it was from, but something precious was taking <coughs> place in that moment. Now when I try so hard to reconnect to that preciousness, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because when we try, we try from here. The heart doesn't try. The heart just stops trying so that things could actually be felt again. But the mind tries. And when you try to feel something again, which once was, you usually don't get back to that. Usually. Oh my. You don't, that's not how it works. Now he says like this. Let's take my best example, he says. I'm sitting on the subway on 72nd Street. This is in, in, in Manhattan. 
I see this absolute beautiful girl and I catch her right before she goes through the door. And I ask her what her name is. She tells me her name and her number. And this name and this number is so mm -hmm. precious to me. Givat is it precious. I learned it 101 times. After that, mm -hmm. I, what he wanted to say is I remembered it, I got home, I dialed it mm -hmm. with such hislav, with such enthusiasm. Baruch Hashem, I marry her and I have 10 children. <clears throat> and at this point in my life, when you ask me what my wife's number is, I'll say it straight without even thinking about it, right? In all honesty, does it have the same preciousness like when I met her on the subway, when she told me her number? The saddest thing in the world is that it doesn't do anything anymore. The highest level in the world is imagine you could reach that level that after you're married for 60 years and you have great-grandchildren, your wife's name or number is as precious like that moment when the door is being closed on 72nd Street. You know, my wife and I had the privilege of seeing this one time with a couple who was actually married for probably close to 60 years in Los Angeles. And it touched us so deep. We had started crying. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> it was so embarrassing because we were sitting in someone's living room with this cute couple in their 80s, but the, it was almost like he was. we were meeting them after their first date. Mm. <laughs> it, was, it was the cutest thing. He, he passed away two years ago. It was the cutest thing in the world. <laughs> so, so hold on a second. So is it possible? It's, it's, if it wasn't possible, then we wouldn't have a concept of soulmates in this world. We would just have a rain, you know, just marriage, the shame marriage, because that's what you do in life. Now, I want you to, to realize, however, sometimes Rabbi Shlomo goes off on these tangents and, and he doesn't really come back to where he started. T tonight, you have to realize, you have to keep in mind the end of last week's Parsha, Lama Hareo Salah why are you making it so hard on Yidin? And the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be receiving the answer of all answers in the beginning of this Pasha. Here, there is a mind-blowing Torah from the Ishbitza. When God sends Moshe to Paro, let my people go, it doesn't go. It's strange, you know, just think about that for a second. You know what that means in our lives? That like Moshe Rabbeinu was told that you should go and do this, and what ends up happening? Not what God said would happen. For instance, God, we all know that there's a, always this voice in our hearts and souls for 2,000 years. Go back to Yerushalayim. Go back to Yerushalayim. And Rabbi Shlomo said, what brought us back to Yerushalayim isn't what we saw, because what we saw was destruction. What brought us back to Yerushalayim is what we heard when we left. The Beis Hamidr saying, you have to come back one day. That's what every Yid hears whenever he says, Okay, we came back. Hasn't really been that smooth, right? To say the least. Hasn't really been that smooth. But it's such a strange thing, because we live in a world of, when God says you should do this, that means life should be good for you. How many people wonder, they say, wait a second, I took upon myself more mitzvahs, I became frumer, I became holier, I became shomer negia. I don't do this on Shabbos anymore. How come, how come it's not working now? I did all that. I did all the things that God says you should do in the world. Why isn't it working now? <coughs> and Moshe Rabbeinu was coming back to God saying, Hold on a second. God, you told me to go and do this. I did it. And Paro didn't listen. It's a very strange thing. Paro doesn't listen, next line, and Yidin aren't listening. Nate, you're supposed to, you just mentioned this pasuk, Velo shamu Moshe mikotzer ruach, they just didn't understand it either. Moshe Rabbeinu is so weirded out. <coughs> By the burning bush, God says, you're going to go and you're going to take people out of Egypt. In my name you're going to go. And he goes to the Egyptian king, Egyptian king says, sorry, no, forget that. He goes to Amisra and says, get ready, we have to get out of here. And they say, um, who are you talking to? So, and this is so important, everyone in here. The Ishbitzer says that when you hear God's word, but it's not shining in front of you, meaning it's not really clear what God really wants you to do right now, because it's not working, or whatever it means, 
Don't think that nothing is happening. Something absolutely powerful is taking place. When we were slaves in Egypt and we weren't free yet, God's words could not reach us completely. What's God, by the way, what is he talking about? What's God's words? God's words. Can Moshe Rabbeinu tell Am Yisrael, it's time to get out of here. They heard words, didn't penetrate them that clearly. Look, how many of us know that we should be doing certain things and yet we don't do them? How do we, how do we understand that? Unless everyone in here does exactly um, <laughs> what there could be. I never know who I'm sitting in front of. Right? I think, yeah, some of us here, we do everything. Right? But with me, <laughs> you're a good liar too. When we're with me, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I should be doing all these things and yet I don't I blame it on whatever I blame it on but if God's word was shining so clear to me I would get up and do it and you know what I could say? I could walk around saying I did what God wants of me you know what you can't say? and it feels so precious do you realize that? I'm going to say this again if you just did everything you were told to do holy things without anything in between you and the Word of God. Everything was clear. You would do it. And you could walk around, checklist saying, I did it, and I'm holy. Do you know what you would not feel? It wouldn't be precious to you. It wouldn't feel special to you. It wouldn't feel personal, intimate, meaningful, and all of the above. <clears throat> Don't try hard to feel unclear. We're usually not clear. Don't try to say, now, okay, I'm going to try to do something not on a level of utmost clarity so I can understand what Shlomo was saying. What do we do that's clear to us? What do we keep that's clear? What's so clear to us that are in our Yiddish gate that we're, that we're keeping? What happens, Reb Shlomo is saying, what happens to a person, and he's going to say it inside better, better, much better, what happens to a person when he hears the word of Hashem, but the word of God for him <coughs> is in exile, it's in Galut. And Ishbitz is saying, we were in such an intense Galus in Egypt that even God's words couldn't reach us. We always say, oh, if only God would come down and appear to us and tell us, this is what we want. You know that we were like that once as a people? And that didn't get us anywhere either. So even if Hashem came down to you and said to you, Donnie, right now, <coughs> open up a breast love center in Berlin, or whatever it is he would tell you, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't, it, it would be <coughs> completely whacked out for you. You wouldn't know, you wouldn't know what to do. There's nothing there. Some, for some people, because even sometimes, even Hashem's words are in Golos, meaning, as far as we're concerned, God's words are in exile. The Egyptian shiabud, the Egyptian slavery, was the worst, because we were mentally meshuabad, we were mentally enslaved. But if someone comes up and looks at us and says, this is what you need to do, that doesn't mean anything to us. That's the scariest thing in the world. The Baba Chirabi said over and over again, the greatest sign of someone who is ill is the person who doesn't know that they're ill. That's the worst thing in the world. <coughs> That's the worst thing in the world. Am Yisrael had no idea they were even ill in Egypt. And Moshe Rabbeinu was told, go to them and tell them, and he comes back and he says, God, they're not, I don't understand, what kind of a shliach am I? Or what kind of a message are you giving me? It's not working. And what is Moshe Rabbeinu told in last week's parasha, the last pasuk? Okay, now I'm going to show you something huge. And the Midrash, I saw Midrash, scared the daylights out of me. And Shabbos, I saw this Midrash, <coughs> got me so scared. The Midrash says, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. The Midrash says, at that moment when Moshe Rabbeinu said, why are you doing so bad for Am Yisrael? And God says, okay, now I'll show you. The Midrash says, God says, now I'll show you what I'm going to do. But when what your student, Yeshua, is going to see, you're not going to see. And the Midrash says he lost Eretz Yisrael. Mm -hmm. Moshe Rabbeinu lost Eretz Yisrael, not when he hit the rock. 
But last Shabbos, when he said, why are you doing so bad for Yidin? He wants instant graphic. He wants to see it instantly, how, how God's word works. And Moshe Rabbeinu is about to be taught a lesson in the beginning of our parsha where God is saying to him, that's not what this world is about. And look how he says it. This is so amazing. We're about six, seven lines from the bottom. What happens to you when you hear something absolutely beautiful, <clears throat> but you're not really ready for it yet? Ever happened to anybody? You hear, meaning, you hear a derech in Avodah Hashem. You hear an exalted way of serving God. You hear about the beauty of Yiddishkeit, but you're not ready for it yet? What happens to you? Two things are happening to you. Your faro, your paro inside of you is getting worse and worse every second. Your evil side becomes so strong. You know why? Because your evil side begins to feel so threatened that you might be jumping into the holiness. But your holy side, your holy side is suddenly filled with longing. And listen to the next line. The more you feel and you know that you're not yet on the level, the more you realize how precious it is. How precious it is to be part of something beyond. I want to stop for a second. This is a very important, important paragraph. It's a very hard paragraph. But the end of this paragraph is monumental. Not just for tonight's learning, but for to be a Jew today. To be a human being today. Rabbi Shlomo said something amazing. God tells us exalted things all the time. We see the possibilities of becoming holy, <coughs> becoming holy, of growing spiritually, of growing all the time. But sometimes inside we know, well, I still have to do certain things before then. I still got to get my act together in this area. So Reb Shlomo says, do you know what happens to you when you hear of a way of living that you're not there yet, but you want to be so badly, but you know you're not ready yet? The more you feel and you know that you're not yet there, the more you realize how precious it is. How precious it is to be part of something beyond. I remember, personally speaking, I remember seeing a friend of mine on a Friday afternoon, before I was married, when he was shopping in the Shuk for Shabbos. And he was married. And I remember inside, I was looking at him, and I have no idea what's going on in this person's house. I have no idea if it's Shalom Bias, if it's not Shalom Bias, but all I could see is that there's a person here that knows where he's going to eat tonight, and he's eating at his own Shabbos table. That's all I saw, okay? And this is so deep, I hope I, haven't, I, hope I even have the words for it. But my gut was to turn to Hashem and say, how could it be that I don't have my own Shabbos table yet, instead of just tapping into the beauty of there's such a precious thing as a person having his own Shabbos table. See, Moshe Rabbeinu sees that things aren't working yet, and he says, why are you making it bad? What Hashem was really telling him is, don't you see how precious it is when things do work? Don't you see how holy it is when things are actually coming together? It is what it is. How do you see that? Huh? How do you see that? Okay. Good question. How can anyone see? How can anyone see that which they don't have yet? That's the question. It's a good question. But Reb Shlomo is saying here, the more you realize that you're not there yet, that in-between of knowing there's something great that could happen in the world, and you're not there yet, that is when the term precious takes place. That's when things start becoming precious to you in your life. Next page, next page. And here, I want you to open your hearts. Because they've been closed until now, right? <laughs> here we go, everyone. This is it. So many people go through so many struggles in their life until they reach the level where they're supposed to be. Reb Shlomo says, a struggle is a very holy and precious thing. All the pain and all the sufferings, you can't reach the other side any other way. You don't wake up in the morning and reach 
that which you are longing for? It's clear to anyone that you shouldn't get angry every two minutes. It's clear to you like daylight, but you can't help it. You might have to work on it your whole life until you reach the level that you don't blow up on every stupid thing. But you see what it is? Why do I need to go through the whole thing, David? Why do I even have to go through this? What? God can just remove the struggle from me so I can just be holy and sit and learn all day long. If God wants, that's what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying to God. Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu was saying to God, you could take them out right now. Why do they have to witness the pain you're about to afflict on other people? Why do they have to spend one more second still in Egypt? And that's what we're saying to God. We say to God, God, don't you want like a polished Halig and Neshama that sits and learns Torah all day long and goes to the mikveh 18 times a day and Shabbos 36 times? Wouldn't you want that? Isn't that what you want? Forget about what I want. Isn't that what you want, God? Don't you want that? You can make it so easy. God, if you wanted that, you could do it right now. Why are you making it so hard? So look what he says here. Friends, this is the deepest... And this is what God is telling Moshe in our Parsha. The struggle you go through in order to rid yourself from the anger is the most precious thing in the world. Now he used the, the test of anger here. But really it's whatever it is you're struggling with. That struggle that you go through, the process, not the actual pain. It could be the pain. Not that it hurts. But the avod that you do there is the most precious thing that you could ever do. And he's going to say, it's not just precious, he's going to take it even a deeper level. Until you taste the preciousness of the unclarity, look what he says, Chavra, put on your deep thinking caps right now. <laughs> Until you taste the preciousness of the unclarity, you might be leaving Egypt, but you will walk, sorry about that typo, right back there. Okay, this is, this is so deep. And bear with me. Hashem should have compassion on us and explain to us what this, what this actually means. The Shlomo says that you can be taken out of Mitzrayim. God could do that. But you know what will end up happening to you? You will walk right back to Egypt five million times a day. You know why? Because you didn't get out of Egypt. God got you out of Egypt. And we see it with ourselves. Hmm? We say, you know, where are the cucumbers? We love Egypt. It's also you don't have to like a little bit. It's like, you know, go do this, then you try to go do this. Yeah, but you, you know what? When I see someone struggle. struggling, I'd rather them not be a robot. I'd rather them not suffer. But if you struggle with it, you struggle with it, and, and you get there, it's like you've earned something, and it's yours, and you, it changes you. Yeah, but you know what? But you know what? Sometimes you see people in pain. You don't. You could say that about yourself. You have no right to say that about any anyone in the world. Not you, Celia. None of us. You about ourselves. It's true. You want to earn it. You see a yidl that's starving. You see someone in pain. You see someone whose marriage he's married three times. Remember the that famous funny Shlomo joke about uh, about um. I mean, someone once came to someone very holy in the Shlomo Chavra and he said, you know, I love I loved Shlomo weddings so much, I myself had three of them. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are like three or four people that could actually say that. How about this, three or four? Right? Huh? How about this, like three or four? <coughs> no, I mean that they themselves they got married, yeah. remarried. Right. <laughs> <laughs> many, 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 three. Oh, oh, many, many. No, that they themselves had to go through three Shlomo Chupas. I know, it's a pretty weird thing. But what Reb Shlomo is saying here is something so amazing. He says, what Reb Shlomo is going to say is that God is about to tell Moshe Rabbeinu that without this unclarity, if it was just so clear, right now this is what God wants, they'll leave Egypt. But they might not go to Eretz Yisrael afterwards. Reb Shlomo says in the transcript, it's not here. He said that if it worked the way that Moshe Rabbeinu wanted it to work, that God would just say, let people go, and he did it, and they left Egypt, you know what Yidin would start asking themselves right after they got out of Egypt? Hmm, where should That's we go? Next. Canada? Australia? He says it's Canada, Australia, America. 
you don't end up in Yerushalayim unless you long for it. Unless you were wondering for years, what does God really want of me? You end up in other places, but you don't end up in Yerushalayim. That wondering, that unclarity, that place where it's not totally clear to you, and the struggle that you go through, that unclarity, what you get from it, that brings you in Yerushalayim, and further, it keeps you in Yerushalayim. Because even once in Yerushalayim, you're like, well, I know I have to be here, but now what? And that struggle to understand what God wants of you today never ends, and you're so happy, eventually, with being tied up in that. It's not a wrestling match. It's this love match. It's not... It's a struggle, but it's a struggle that you, you're so happy that this is like we say, Anu amelim behem amelim. We say, we work and they work. When we do a siyam and sha in a, in a, in a masechta and in, in, uh, in tractate in Talmud, we end off by saying, we work and they work. We work with the very Torah wondering, what do you really want, God? And they work in the marketplace trying to understand how to make the next buck. When you stop wondering what God wants of you because you're so happily, happy that things are clear to you, then life stops being alive. It's not life you're living. Just a walking, breathing organism, that's it. Nothing more than that. So again, the struggle you go through in order to rid yourself from whatever it is you're struggling with is the most precious thing in the world. And until you taste the preciousness of the unclarity, of the struggle, you might be leaving Egypt, but you'll walk right back there. Or, you'll end up anywhere in the world, but you won't end up going, Ela Aretz Asher Eka. That's, the Yishalayim is not the destination. Now look at the next paragraph. Can you imagine, and this is going to be a shocker for all, it was a shocker for me, can you imagine how much Avram Avinu went through until he reached the level of being Avram Avinu? Some of us think that he was born a way out hippie, sharing everything with everyone, and Sarah's walking around with beads, <coughs> always happy to let all the guests come to their house. Do you know what the Holy Tzanzer says? It would be blasphemy. Listen to this words. This is shot of mamish, kishka shocking. It would be blasphemy if I would say this. The Tzanzis says that Avram Avinu was born with the stingiest soul in the world. And he managed worked his way up to give everything away. You see what it is? Anything which falls into my lap, I'm not giving over to my children. Whatever I work on like a dog is what I give over to my children. Avram and Yitzchak and Yaakov worked so hard till they got there spiritually, mentally, divinely. They turned their kishkas over a million times a second, paved the way for us. The real Yerusha, inheritance you leave for your children, is not the few, few rubles you leave. What you leave for your children is what you went through. The way you purify your heart, your heart is what, you, what is left for your children. You know, I... One time Rabbi Riskin was giving a, an Aliyah <laughs> talk somewhere in America. And, he, and someone, uh, someone said to him um, something very interesting. Someone said to him, uh, you know, how could we leave our, 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 our parents here? Which is a very valid claim. How could we leave our parents? It is, it's a very valid claim. So Rabbi Riskin said, you don't live for your parents. You live for your children. You have to honor your parents. You don't live for your parents. You live for your children. Do you know what it means? Do you know that my friends that grew up seeing their parents struggling so much just in order to be here in Eretz Yisrael, they have Eretz Yisrael. Friends of mine that see what their parents gave up in order to be here, they have Eretz Yisrael. Friends of mine that seen how much their parents worked so hard to be connected to the Yiddishkeit, but they couldn't teach the children halacha, but they saw how much their parents wanted to be part of it, that is what's given over to the children. That's passed on to children. All the things which just fall into my lap, Rabbi Shlomo says, they don't, move, they don't continue. We are sons of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov because 
what they worked on is what we received, is what we inherited. Their Yerusha, the Yerusha we received from them, is their pain and struggle. Not the clarity. It's the pain and struggle. Let me ask you, friends. <coughs> the first thing that Avram was told by God was the most unclear thing in the world. Go. Where? I'll show you. Is that clear? Mm-hmm. Rishbitzer says that a yid's, a yid's journey in life is asher ar eka. Those two words is in our life, asher ar eka. God is always telling us less. He never tells you where or how or exactly what it is. But if you're willing to walk the walk and dance the dance of asher ar eka, you're sitting with Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Sar, Rivka, Rachel. You're sitting with everyone who also didn't know exactly what God wants of them. You think Yitzchak knew exactly what God wants of him when his father told him, we're going up to the mountain to be slaughtered? Mm. Yitzchak didn't know either. You think Yaakov knew what God wanted of him when he has to run away from his parents' house? He didn't know either. You think Yosef knew what God wanted of him when he was thrown into a pit? It was clear, all the tzaddikim, it was clear to them? He didn't know either. Same thing with David and Shlomo and all the Nevi'im. They didn't know exactly. Even their Nevu'as, it says, Even the way they would prophesy would be like, I know something deep is going on here, but it's not crystal clear to me. The only person to who it was crystal clear to at a certain <coughs> point in life is the person who asked Rabbana Shalom, Why are you making it so hard? Don't be scared to not be a tzaddik, friends. Do you know what that means? No. Don't be scared to not be so holy for a few minutes and ask God a very human question. Why are you making it so bad? But you said that's what Moshe didn't get into it at all. And that's what the Midrash, I'm saying, that's the Midrash, the sh- I didn't see anywhere else. I saw the Midrash said that, but you know what? I think Moshe Rabbeinu was complete with God not putting him in, into Eretz Yisrael so that he could learn the following lesson of what Hashem was trying to explain to him over here. I have to believe that. I want to believe that. And I want to believe that I will be completely happy and shalem and complete with myself if I have the chutzpah to ask God the tough questions from a holy place, even if it means that I'm not going to be this holy tzaddik that says that people can write about me. He just suffered and never asked any questions. He received everything happily. Do you know that when I hear about those tzaddikim, I have nothing to do with them. Where are they in my... I have nothing... Meaning, they probably opened up gates upon gates upon gates for me. It's clear, I'm not lessening from that kedusha. But you and I today, where, where, where is that in our life today? So I have to be willing to ask God heavy questions from a holy place, and it can't be about my own pain. It has to be about seeing someone else suffering. Vayar b'siv lotam. Moshe Rabbeinu sees them suffering. And you have to only ask when it has to do with why are they suffering? Why is it so hard for somebody else? Okay. I heard from uh, Shlomo Stepner, and I'm not sure where he brought the uh, explanation, but he said, when, when Moshe Rabbeinu was standing next to the snare boil, it says in the Torah that he covered his face. And the explanation was that God wanted to reveal completely to him, but he didn't want to see the whole thing. He didn't want to see, he didn't want to see this clarity. He wanted to see, he didn't want to know it at all, because he figured if he knows it all, he won't be able to feel the people. Because if I know the answer of everybody, then, then uh, you know, you're going through pain. I know, I know the answer why. He didn't want to know the why, because he wanted to feel the people. So I think it goes very well. He didn't even realize how much he'd feel the pain, I think. Yeah. It goes perfectly, was it? <sighs> We're in the middle of this big paragraph in this page. All those you didn't hope you see it inside. It's about ten lines from the top. Twelve lines. All those Yidin who are just, so to speak, from, but they don't work on it, their children don't give a damn. 
Maybe their children will be flung because of a miracle, or maybe someone else will turn them on. So here God... Okay, so now we're wrapping it up. This is how, what he does so beautifully. So here God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Va'era in our parsha, Va'era. Look what the words, Va'era. Do you see it inside, friends? I, I want you to look at it inside. It's very important. So here God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Va'era el Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov bekel shakai. I want you to open your hearts in the deepest way. But by the way, the rest of that pasuk is Ushmi Hashem lo nodati lahem, which means what? What does that mean? I always thought well, I always never understood this pasuk. God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, "Okay, I'm going to start explaining to you life. I revealed myself to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, but you know what? I didn't really reveal myself to them." Ushmi Hashem lo nodati lahem. My my name, my real name of God, lo nodati lahem. I didn't reveal it to them. That's how God is explaining something. Moshe Rabbeinu is making feel better. It's like, hey. Your grandparents, they didn't get it either. <laughs> they, they were also unclear. But look what he says. Why was it so hard for Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? Because when they received God's word, it wasn't shining from all four corners. It wasn't that clear that this is God's word. But one thing was clear to them. That unless I turn over my kishkas a thousand times, a million times, to do what God says, I won't really understand what He wants. This is so deep. What He's saying here is that, well, you know what Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov knew? <coughs> they knew that the only way to know what God means through the commandments is if I keep on working on myself, pouring over what God told me five million times. That's the only way I'll know what God really wants. For instance, like this. God says, keep Shabbos holy, right? But none of us really understand today what Shmira Shabbos is. Do you know why? Because if I just kept Shabbos the way I understand exactly what God means to me, that Shabbos is, all I would taste of Shabbos is the day where I don't work. But the Oneg of Shabbos, the bliss of Shabbos, where Shabbos takes me, I only taste that when I cry to the Rebona and I'm trying to understand why did, you, why did you create the concept of Shabbos? Only when I work so hard to understand why did you create it? Do you know a person that gets married because <coughs> God says you have to get married Ben Yudchet Lachupa right? So he gets married he is married but you know what he'll never take if, if, if marriage isn't hard and if marriage is just clear He'll never understand why God sent him to be with this person. There is no other way. I once heard that um, people, kids that never see their parents arguing or fighting, and their parents, Dafka, try to hide it because they don't want to mess the children up, it's a little bit of a disservice, you know why? Mm -hmm. Because then they walk the streets of the world, when they find their soulmate, and when they have an argument, they say, uh-oh, something's wrong. Because I knew uh, my image of marriage is perfection. Because their parents were hiding it from them all the time. It's a very tricky thing. How do you show your children? It's a very deep thing. How do you show your children the beauty of the struggle? Like you have struggle with your spouse, but you, you keep the honor there. You keep the love there. You keep the respect there. But you show your children that we are two people trying to become one as well our whole life. It's a very deep thing. Yeah, the It's just very hard, actually, which I've I, I, I been working with that for months and months ago. Is to really get Shabbos, you've got to work. So, you know, <laughs> that's, like, that's like a really, like, I go through Shabbos on Shabbos, is eating and davening. And right. Like, you're saying to get to the real owning of Shabbos, the real solicit of Shabbos, mm -hmm. you got to really work at it. That's Shabbos. You have, to, you have to work hard <laughs> <clears throat> to get Shabbos. And it's true. If it's you so don't true. work so hard, you don't get Shabbos. So then Shabbos is the sa is, Saturday. It's Saturday. It's right. right. But, but right. So there's something that's... And, 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 <laughs> and you know, you have to cry. You have to cry to hear God always saying, don't you know that there's so much more than just Saturday? You know, we have to cry to always have Hashem that's say this, pleasant. don't you know there's more? <clears throat> that's not pleasant. You have to work through that. To have to work so hard. No, might be tough. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Hazal says a very interesting thing. With regard to somebody who doesn't have Onik Shabbos, he says, you're doing all the things you're supposed to do on Shabbos. You're keeping Shabbos. You're not violating Shabbos. But you don't have the Onik. You don't have the joy, the beauty of Shabbos. He says, in Olam Haba, you'll be in Gan Eden and you'll be sitting on a bench watching everybody else enjoy the pleasure of Hashem. I mean, that's, that's Shabbos. Shabbos is, Mamish, has to be Onik. The Karatel Shabbos Onik. Simple it's as it key, is. It's the key of Shabbos. I, I want to I bring it to context in, in our parsha. Why does Moshe Rabbein, why is he told by Hashem, okay, I'm going to start explaining to you life and how it works. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, I revealed myself to them, but I made it unclear for them. How does that, how does that help Moshe Rabbein? He says, great. You made them suffer, and are you going to make me suffer too? No. What is he saying? What is God saying to Moshe Rabbein? He's saying, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov discovered the depths of serving God when it's not clear to you, which is the way that it's bediyeved lechatchila. That's the way that that's what you and I go through here. They discovered how deep it is to turn your kishkas <laughs> over a million times because then they have Shabbos. Then they really have a relationship with God. They discovered that that is the way. That's the most. I, I'm not. I know that I'm not even close to giving over what this really means. I'm just letting you know. I know that it's not even close what I'm saying, because it's so it's so mind-boggling, and because I, I also don't want I see your faces and everyone here is thinking like, <clears throat> okay, that means that I, I have to, that means that the answer is to keep on suffering. No, it's not. That's not the, the answer. Is not to keep on suffering. The answer is, how much are you going to enjoy the sweat that you break out of from exercising? But that's it. That's mamish it. You're not going to grow muscles unless you work it. There, there, there is no other way. A malach, a malach, that's how a malach works. But us, Basar Vadam, Avram Nitzlak and Yaakov, that's how we go through it in this world when it's unclear to us. This is what God was telling Moshe Rabbeinu in the beginning of our parsha. End of this big fat paragraph. Do you know what's so precious about Avram Nitzlak and Yaakov? The preciousness was that I never told them something that was clear from one corner of the world to the other. That is what was so precious. <coughs> and they met me. See, that's really what... And they met me. And they fell in love with the sweat. And they fed, Because we all know that when we do finally get up on the treadmill or go to a <coughs> or play ball, you work harder than when you do sitting in front of a computer. You physically work harder, and yet you feel so much better. And you swear that this is going to be your daily routine. Right? <laughs> and that never, ever happens. Sometimes the Ribbon Shalom tells you something, and it's not clear yet, but it's so precious. It's so precious. Something, sometimes God tells you something, and it's so clear. It's very beautiful, but it has no preciousness. Was there ever a moment when things were clearer to us than on Mount Sinai? God spoke to us face to face. But what does God tell us on Mount Sinai? What does Hashem tell us when things are clearest? Remember, I took you out of Egypt. Meaning, what's the first thing He brings us back to? You know what God was telling us? Don't forget the preciousness which you felt when you knew there was one God when you were in Egypt. But it wasn't so clear to you yet. Givat is it precious. Don't forget it. Like Reb Shlomo did here is amazing. He's saying, take the clearest moment in Jewish history when God speaks to the whole nation. It happened one time. What's the first thing God says to us? Anochi. Anochi what? What's the rest of that pasuk? Sherot satiham et mitzrayim beit avadim. And you're sitting there thinking, we're finally free and you're reminding me what it was to be a prisoner? That's the first thing you tell me, God, in this amazing moment? No, Rabbi Shlomo says that's exactly what God wanted to remind the free person. Don't ever forget how precious the sweat was, how precious the struggle was. Don't ever, ever forget anything. This is a little bit different than the way we learned it a few, a few months ago, about Menashe and Ephraim, a few weeks ago. Because God says, you know what will happen? 
when you forget how what it took to become clear, clarity will mean nothing to you. Clarity will mean nothing to you. Nothing. Avodas Hashem will be a, 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 a given. That, you know how sad that is, that Avodas Hashem is a given? I want to share with you something. There's a guy here in the neighborhood. He's not here tonight. And I have, I had a very hard time looking at him, Davin and Yishol. I'll tell you why. Because he's, it's always the same. He comes in there, doesn't have to work on himself, doesn't matter where they're holding and davening, shuckling starts, davening goes right away, boom. He's always with it. Judging on the outside, I looked at him and said, doesn't this guy ever feel the need to be like, let, let it be strong today before I start going like this? Like He just goes right into the swing, into the shuckling swing all the time. And I had a dream about him. I had a dream that I asked him, isn't it hard for you that everything's so mechanical? He says to me, trust me, between every single shuckle, I have to make a decision to shuckle back and forth again. You see, it's asur to judge anyone that looks like everything's going clear for them because people's level, everyone, every person's level of clarity happens, or unclarity, takes place at a completely different time. What's clear to you right now may be completely unclear to me. What's clear to me might be completely unclear to you. There's a rhythm of life. <coughs> There's a rhythm going on. You, none of us ever know when we stop to take a breath. Because on the outside, we show faces of, I have it together. <laughs> and that's the sheker of all shekers. So Hashem tells us on Mount Sinai, oh, you look like you all have it together now, right? Clean people, three days of preparation. Don't you dare forget what it took you guys to even stand here right now. And we, every moment after Mount Sinai until we get into the Eretz Yisrael, which is another four svarim, of Torah is always a reminder of God saying to them, don't be so sure about yourselves. Open up. Be able to show that you're vulnerable. Stop this. It's, ne it's, the mu it's not going to work, the machism. Show that you're struggling. And obviously, it's always like this, that we feel so much better in life when I know that you're struggling with something that I struggle too. Look at this last line. You know what God was telling us? Don't forget the preciousness which you felt when you knew there was one God, when you were in Egypt, but it wasn't so clear yet. Give out the precious... Do you, know what he, do you know what he's connecting us to? What's the first paragraph we learned tonight? That Chazal say, this is why his brain is such a genius brain, he opened up by saying that Chazal say that the greatest form of learning is Girsa de Yankuta, is the way a child learns. Why? Because a child learns, it's not totally clear to them what they're learning, but they're so, in, they're so thrilled about the fact that they're in a relationship <coughs> with something holy, whether they understand it or not. Chazal say that's the highest form of learning. Not the learning when you go through a tosfos and you say, you can give it over 50 times, but where it's not clear, but you know something big is going on. In Mitzrayim, it wasn't clear, but we knew something was up. God's words weren't clear to us, but we knew something was going on. So again, here we're ending. And thank you for, I know we're a little bit later than usual, but we have to go through this. Here, Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Rebbe Onashle'elam, what's going on here? You're giving me a message to the Yidin and a message to Paro, and it's not working yet. The Rebbe Onashle'elam says, Va'era el Avraham Yitzchak vel Yaakov bekel shakai, u'shmi Hashem lo nodati lehem. This is the first way a Yid learns how precious something is, when I don't reveal to them my name exactly, as clearly as you'd like it to be. 
there's a level when God's words are shining into my being and I'm so completely clear with what God wants of me. There's no problem. Then there's a level that I can't do anything with God's words. It's just hanging inside of me. Look, Am Yisrael didn't know what to do with Moshe Rabbeinu who was saying to them, you're about to be a free people. But something was happening on the insides. And this is the in-between. Reb Shlomo says, this is Parshas Va'era. When do we start being redeemed for real? More in, later, in, at the end of Bo, really. But this Shabbos, it's like we're, we're in exile, but we already start to smell the Geula. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do with it. And Hashem, it's like this Parsha is Hashem asking us, are you willing to be like Avram Avinu, Lech Lecha? To where? To Asher Ar Eka? Are you willing to do that? If God told you Lech Lecha and He told you exactly where to go to, maybe you'd do. Maybe you would leave whatever you need to leave. Maybe you'd end up wherever you wanted to end up in. But maybe you'd walk back as well. Hashem wants you out of there. He doesn't want you to ever think that you have a place back in the in Mitzrayim. And the last paragraph, when we eventually really get out of Egypt, it means that my toenails are free, meaning every part of me is free. There's nothing, there's, I have no shayachut at all anymore to that which enslaved me. Nothing, I'm, I'm literally out of it. <coughs> this Shabbos, meaning Va'era, our parsha, nothing of me is really free. And you know, I have to say, like, Olam Azar is like Va'era. Nothing of me is real. Are we, are we really free? Nothing of me is free. We're, we're all slaves to something. But deep, deep inside, I know there is such a thing as freedom. Which is, was already a big chidush for Am Yisrael and Yitzrayim. Those years in Egypt, not only were they slaves, they didn't know there's a concept of freedom. In our parsha, they begin to know that there's a concept of freedom, which is already not only halfway there, it's the greatest matana in the world. It creates the intimacy, it creates the preciousness, it creates the longing, it creates desires, it creates workout, it creates everything that motivates a person in this world. Inside of the inside, I know there is something so precious. So, why is it so hard? Why is, why is it taking so long? Why is it so hard? I'll end with this story. This is an amazing story. I heard today on this tape from Rib Shlomo. There was a year in the town of Lemberg, which actually is very close to my heart right now because my uncle was just visiting from Buenos Aires. He was talking about how my grandfather, who I'm in after, was from the town of Lemberg, Lvov, Lemberg. It's where Rabbi Nachman actually went to travel to receive medical treatment for his tuberculosis before he died in Lemberg in the year 1809. Um, and in the town of Lemberg there was this Yid who kept on malshining, he kept on, it's like in 1850, he kept on um, tattletaling to the authorities there that all the great tzaddikim in the town, they're really just leading the children corrupt, making these false promises about Judaism and God and everything. And, the Tsar, whoever it is, was there in, Aus in, 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 in Austria. It was Austria at the time, had all the tzaddikim thrown into jail. Because this one Yidla kept on tattletaling on the tzaddikim. So eventually, um, they got the Rapshitzer. He, he was the one that wasn't, he was saved from this. He wasn't arrested. <laughs> and uh, they kind of had to figure out a way that tzaddikim, once they were released, how do we get this Yid to stop doing this? He kept on throwing the tzaddikim into jail. There was one tzaddik in town, I forget his name right now. And this tzaddik, this, this Rebbe, Reb Avram, I think, he always used to call everyone, oh, this person's a tzaddik, he's a tzaddik. It's like he was the one person that really saw the good in everyone, he was so holy, everyone saw that this person is on such a high level because he referred to everyone as tzaddik, tzaddik, tzaddik. So they thought if anyone could put a, a curse on such a person who keeps on throwing rebbies into jail, it'd be a person who's so holy and exalted. So they came <coughs> to this Reb Avram and they said to him, can you please curse this person that he should 
get, get him out of here. Have him stop throwing people, these tzaddikim into jail. This tzaddik said, I want you, he told the Rav he said, I want you to come right now down to the cellar and meet me in the cellar. I go downstairs. And there was a huge barrel filled with liquid. Water, it looked like water. The tzaddik looked at the Rav and he said, do you know this barrel is filled with my tears. Tears that I cry to Hashem that I should only be able to call someone a tzaddik and mean it. I worked, I had to cry over this day and night for years and you want me to throw that all away right now so that I could curse someone? And he wasn't willing to curse anybody. But you know what he was doing to this other tzaddik? You know what he was showing the other rabbim in town? He was showing, you look at me and you think I'm such a tzaddik and therefore you come to me to do something really big. Do you know what I had to go through to become, mm. to look at people this way? You know, Rabbi Nachman said about himself, I might come from the Baal Shem Tov, I might be, come from a very illustrious family, but the only way I became who I became is because all of the wondering, what do you want from me, Hashem? And the fact that it was unclear to Rabbi Nachman from a young age is what made Rabbi Nachman Rabbi Nachman. In concerts in the 60s and 70s, Rabbi Shlomo standing on stage crying, if you love us so much, God, he's saying this in public, where were you when you threw six million get into the gas chamber? You see, we have to ask in this world, stop playing tzaddik. <coughs> Because even the tzaddik of all tzaddiks, Moshe Rabbeinu, had to ask also. And Bezrat Hashem, if we ask right, with utmost kedusha and sincere respect to the Rav Shleiman, it'll be revealed to us how precious the unclarity is. And we'll never ask God, just lay it on me. Because we won't want that. Because at that moment, I got to the finish line, but game is over. Kaddish Baruch should... Let us fall in love with Parshas Va'era, which is the story of our lives, the power of unclarity, the beauty of it, and everything in life, the unclear things should become precious to us. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, Hebron.